Hello everyone, and welcome back to Zarku Games. Today we are looking at D&D &D Isn't a Balanced Game by Blaine Simple. Um, I don't know who this is. I've never really watched his channel before. I think I might have occasionally. And this is my honest reaction to this video. And we're going to use this as a jumping off point to have a discussion today. So, let's check it out. Hey, um, before we start, I make cool D&D homebrew on my Patreon, and I'd love it if you want to check it out. Okay, thanks, bye. D&D isn't a balanced game. Whoa, that's a hot take right off the bat, so let me explain myself. Okay, Dungeons yeah. and Dragons is a pretty old game, and since the beginning, it's gone through multiple huge overhauls that have changed literally every aspect of the way it's played. Almost everyone can- Okay, we're gonna stop here, um, like 20 seconds in. It hasn't changed every aspect of the way it's played. It is still essentially the same game. So, D&D at its core is a game that is about players on one side. And you have players here. Get in frame. Players and a dungeon master. This is the core of D&D. Um, as this is as opposed to more storytelling based games. Um, or more improv style games. D&D has that two-section dichotomy. That is the essence of D&D. Um, and Dungeons & Dragons is also a loot and experience-based game, as well as a class-based game. These are the essences of what makes Dungeons & Dragons Dungeons & Dragons. In that way, it hasn't changed. It's also a D20-based game. Um, the original Chainmail might not have been, but since it's become D&D Advanced, or Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, um, the infamous red box, then it's always been a D20 based system. Okay, moving on. I can agree that since first edition's conception, literally every other version of the game has been updated with ease of access in mind, basically making the game easier for newer players to learn and for veteran gamers to have less aneurysms over. Thacko would disagree. Obviously, that doesn't take 4th edition into account, because everyone unanimously agrees it never existed. So with all the changes to the way D&D was played, all right, man, 4th edition was actually really good. People just hated on it. And from a game design perspective, 4th edition was probably the best edition D&D has ever put out. It was incredibly balanced. It was incredibly streamlined. And it was way better than 3.5 and even 5th edition. It was a brilliant piece of game design. It just didn't feel enough like D&D &D for people, and they hated on it. It also didn't help that it came out right in the middle of the Pathfinder boon, and Pathfinder felt a lot like Dungeons & Dragons, so people liked that too much. Um, and it was hard to compete with what was basically a patched version of 3.5. How could a game that's had so much time in the oven still be unbalanced? Well, there's a lot of small things that all play into each other that make these problems exist. So, rather than just throw a bunch of dialogue at you all, let's split this into parts. First off, we have the cornerstone of every D&D game, the innocent character sheets. Now, for the most part, I think the rules for building characters are balanced. Unless you're specifically going out of your way to break the game, such as leveling up in weird ways to abuse features that never intended to work together. Never intended to work together? Oh, I mean, I guess if you have, like, four arms, maybe that's what he's talking about. Your characters will almost always be fair, but that's not what's unbalanced about this at all. In the rules, it says that when your character levels up, you can either risk it all to roll your hit points, or play it safe and take the average amount. Both of these options are considered official ways to gain HP, and it falls under the DM to choose a method and the players to roll with it. <laughs> get it. These two methods come with their ups and downs. For example, if you're a wizard and you roll for your health, there's- Oh, we have an ad, guys. Yep, we have an ad. I'm gonna skip this in a second. There's a 50% chance you'll be weaker than a typical wizard, a 17% chance you'll end up average, and a 33% chance you'll be stronger. It makes you as the player feel terrible if you roll poorly, because the random assortment of health doesn't feel earned at all. It's not based around any predetermined factors, it's just luck. 
it's the same thing with rolling stats. If I get a terrible number, then either I drag my party down in fights by being the weak end of the stick, or I purposefully kill my character off and roll up a new set of stats. Yeah, that's right. Rolling for ability scores and health doesn't encourage players to value their characters more, it encourages them to value their stats. If you want to get on the bandwagon and say that taking average in your stats isn't as interesting, I can totally agree with you, but unless we get any other official ways to roll for stats, that's just how it is. I know that point buy is a thing, which lets you purchase stats and place them wherever you'd like for your ability scores, but for rolling hit points, my own personal favorite way works like this. Whoa, you leveled up? Nice. Go ahead and roll your health and see what you get. Oof, that's a shame. Now you have two options. Would you like to take the average amount of hit points for your class, or risk it all one more time and try another roll? At least with this system, the players have more control with the health they end up receiving. It encourages risk. So, we're going to take a quick second here. That's similar to how I actually have done it in 5th edition, which is you take you roll and you take either the average or your roll. It guarantees you take the average. Get at least the average. Um, the reason for this is if you're playing a module, the game assumes you have the average. Modules in 5e are extremely difficult. And... Um, if, especially for newer players, um, if you have players that aren't building their characters to at least a slightly optimum level, they're going to die. I'm playing and co-DMing through a Descent into Avernus right now, and they're already struggling. Um, and several of the characters are well-built, and they're having trouble. Some of them are not well-built, and they're really having trouble. I've done Tomb of Annihilation in the past, and they really struggled. The few characters that didn't build really well. The ones that built well helped, but modules are hard in 5e. And that's just, if you have a competent DM that can really, that uses the monsters how they're supposed to. When he's talking about rolling for stats... Um, 5e doesn't assume you roll for stats. 5e assumes you do the stat array or point by. Uh, those are the, cons the standard ways of doing it because they want you to have a more consistent level. This has to do with bounded accuracy. And I can get onto that a little bit more after the video risk takers to bet more often, and since the chance to take an average health pool is always on the table, players will personally feel responsible for the current health they have. This system of mine gives more health overall, but I like it, because it combines both of the official ways you can gain HP into a nice little package. But you know what's even more unbalanced than when the players have random stats? When the monsters do. Yep, monsters can roll their health too. So you know that adult red dragon dwelling in the mountain up there? Yeah, well, the DM rolled some pretty high numbers, and now the thing has a 100 health more than it should. Why? I don't know. It's built differently, I guess. If you're playing D&D with a more forgiving system for rolling stats, letting monsters roll theirs the same way could definitely spice things up. Otherwise, I'd be very careful with monsters, because in D&D, figuring out how dangerous a fight is can be tricky enough already, and randomizing things can become very unbalanced very fast. Don't believe me? Well, here's a scenario with some expertly drawn images to serve as a visual reference. You have a party full of wizards. Suddenly, out of the forest springs a monster made out of plants and corpses. The shambling mound has appeared. Roll initiative. Hmm, looks like the little wizards are having a hard time down there. Could it be that they've only- Why do you have a party full of wizards? Like, if you have a party full of wizards, you've already undone what D&D intended for you to design. Like, D&D, the designers never expected you to play with four or three, in this case, wizards as your party. Like, that was not how they expect you to go adventuring. Only prepared fire and lightning spells against a monster that's resistant? It's fine. D&D Beyond said that this was a really easy encounter for them, so I'm sure they can survive. Six rounds later. If you're not skilled enough as a DM to read your party's strengths and weaknesses, it doesn't matter how difficult the rulebook says the fight is. Either the players will absolutely obliterate everything in the first few seconds, or it'll be a humiliating TPK. Unless you specifically plan for either of those outcomes, DMs will find their fight scenes to be unfair until they get the hang of reading the room properly. The Lost Minds of Fendelver and Descent into Avernus are official D&D adventures. Both of them have fight scenes that are very tilted towards the party being wiped out in the first session. You'd think 
waiting for a game that's being tested by thousands of people before release. They'd realize that sooner, but nope. Personally, I feel like Wizards of the Coast is getting better at balancing their game, and the newer D&D books are definitely a big step up from the earlier ones. Well, aside from a few, how do you put it, broken additions to the game that were quickly patched afterwards. If there's one book that I know for a fact wasn't given enough time in the oven though, it'd be the Dungeon Master's Guide. You know, one of the more important books to have if you want to play D&D. This thing is filled with a variety of stuff you'd expect a Dungeon Master to need in order to prepare the game properly. From So, we're going to talk about this for a second. As anyone who has done any kind of game design will know, the longer you spend with a system, the more you instinctively understand the limits of a system. Um, the most famous example of this in all of game design is Magic the Gathering. No one had any idea in the beginning of Magic the Gathering that drawing three cards would be significantly stronger than doing three damage. This sounds absolutely absurd to us now. Of course, drawing three cards is one of the strongest things you could do. Why would um, paying one blue mana to draw three cards not be absolutely broken when dealing one dam paying one red mana to deal three damage be the standard going forward with Lightning Bolt? Um, and on conversely, paying one white mana to gain three life with Healing Salve not be, uh, like, completely underpowered. Ancestral Recall, that's the blue one. Couldn't remember for a second. Well, at the beginning of Magic the Gathering, gathering no one had built a card game like this before. So no one really understood that what, how powerful each resource was. And in case anyone out here isn't a Magic the Gathering player and doesn't remember the big the big five at the beginning, you also have Dark Ritual, which gives you three black mana for one black mana, and Giant Growth, which gives you plus three, plus three on a creature for one green mana. But the two that have become staples really throughout, like, to make note of for balance is Insister, we call in blue, and Lightning Bolt in red because they were the ones that were, like, way overpowered and perfect. And why that's important to realize is in D&D, &D, back at the, in 5e, right at the beginning of 5th edition, n even though it was playtested a whole bunch, there wasn't an instinctual understanding of balance yet in how the game would be played to the level that it is six years later. You know, even if you're playtesting it for a year or two, that's not 10 years, or however many years it's been, eight years now. And I like to show you, point people to things like Moon Druid at level two is silly powerful. Um, even the Totem Barbarian is probably Bear Totem, of course, because that's the one you pick, is one of the strongest classes in the entire game. You have, when you're raging, you have resistance to everything but psychic. And these are absurdly strong classes. And he points out the healing spirit being broken. Ah, uh, it was a little strong. It wasn't really that broken. Not to the level that people complained it was. Yeah, it was probably one of the strongest spells in the game. I don't think it was as broken as people were like, oh my gosh, it needed to be patched immediately. Well, it just needed to be effective, uh, like uh, like come into play. Yeah, it was a badly written spell. There's a lot of badly written spells in 5e. Uh, Thunderwave, hello. It's horribly written. It happens. You're not going to get away from that loot tables to shop items all the way up to magic items all the basics are covered <laughs>
but you watch my videos, don't you? You know what insanity can come from the items in this book, and the true unbalanced power that dwells within the pages. Remember the Rod of Security? Well, guess what? If you have two of these things, you can hide in your own private dimension, become immortal, and get to level 20 after a training montage instantly. Hey look, two bags of holding! I wonder what happens if I put one of them inside of the other. Do I want to attune to the Armor of Invulnerability, or the Cloak of Displacements? <laughs> um, hey Blaine, why is it that every attack that targets you misses? Hmm, I never thought a permanent magical ability that hinders almost every attack roll by causing it to roll disadvantage could be overpowered. Who would have thought? You know the dark version of the Little Red Riding Hood story where the hunter fills the wolf's stomach with heavy stones and he dies afterwards? Yeah, what about it? I'm gonna do that, but with this 8,000 pound magical stick. So yeah, there's a lot of items in this book that weren't double checked at all. Some of them are a much lower rarity than they probably should be. As a general rule of thumb, the more text a magic item has in its description, the more broken it tends to be. I can also confirm that until the day this channel dies, the Dungeon Master's Guide and the hilariousness of how broken it can be, it's gonna be the focus of every crazy D&D challenge video I come up with. Now to fin- You obviously- I mean, that some of these are obviously true. I mean, we all- we all remember the, um- bag of holding arrows but they've done to be fair and give 5e the benefit of the doubt it is better than older editions it, anyone who has played through 3.0 will remember the peasant railgun and i might do an entire video someday about um mechanical abuse and why the peasant railgun was hilarious and explaining what that is but just look up the Peasant Railgun if you don't know what it is by now. But they've done a lot better job of patching stuff like that than one would expect. But magic items are for abuse and for creative uses. And that's sort of what they reward. To finish things off, there's one more big balancing issue with D&D that I'd like to share, but it's more of the way the game is meant to be played that causes this issue, and not anyone in particular's fault for why it's the case. Basically, any D&D campaign that has 15th level characters in it have already signed an agreement that states the following. I hereby understand that by continuing this campaign with characters this strong, encounters will be so difficult to balance that the fate of the universe will be at stake every other Friday. Spellcasters that reach late game have so many magical abilities that that no DM could ever plan for what they might do during a session. Teleport magic can make a three month journey take six seconds. Meteors can rain from the sky and obliterate acres of land. A single word is able to kill anyone who says it, and the untamed, unlimited power of a wish spell can now be in your hands. Want to take a crack at planning a DD session with those spells in mind? No? Oh, well, we've got an ad coming you. up. Welcome to Raid Shadow Legends. Okay. If you're wondering just what you're getting into, Raid no, we're not. Shadow from what I've experienced, Hilo oh, okay, D&D is meant to be a vanity. Try it out once or twice just for fun and pure chaos, but if a campaign is getting too hard to manage and the party's a high level, I'd suggest just ending the game on a high note and starting a new one. Now I So, oh wait, what is the thing? Do need to say this. D&D is one of the easiest tabletop games to learn, and that's because of the bare bones structuring of the rules. It's a wait. barren wasteland out here in comparison to other tabletop games like Pathfinder, which have Oh, we're going to get into this topic before... I have to handle the last one before we get into this. Okay. So, for those who don't know, Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition is separated into four. Count them four tiers of play. You have the first tier of play, which is called the local hero. The second tier of play... Can you guys see that? Which is called the regional hero. The third tier of play, where is it? Where's my camera? Which is called the national hero. And the fourth tier of play, which is called the global hero. Um, I believe those are what they're officially called. Um, I know it's local, regional, national. Um, and then you have, like, yeah, then you have global. This is meant to be that the, in the like levels one through four, maybe one through five, but you're doing things like saving the farm or saving your little tiny village. You're stopping the bandit raid or the kobolds or the goblins. At levels 5 through, say, 10, you know, now you're stopping the local warlord or that cult from taking over, you know, 
the the state or that the area the area of your country at levels you know 11 through 15 now you're at the level of I'm assisting our king to stop the you know archmage from starting a war or taking over the kingdom once you hit that 15 through 20 everything you're doing is saving the world you're superheroes at that point it's intended that everything have these global ramifications in the older editions of D&D, by the time once you started hitting level 10, they had built-in rules for things like owning your own castle and settling down and having offspring. And I'm going to plug here Matthew Colwell's um uh what is it? Strongholds and Keeps or something. I can look it up and put it in the description. Um it is an absolutely great resource that adds those things back in. And this is how the higher level parts of D&D have always been played in the traditional sense. And they've started taking them out of the newer editions. And you just kind of have this let's go punch meteors kind of mentality. And all right, let, like, let's get into where he's talking about Pathfinder because this is interesting. Three times more content and three times more hectic power scaling nonsense. Consider yourself lucky to be a part of the D&D community, because if anything feels unbalanced, it doesn't take much for a dungeon master to fix it themselves. The rules are so open-ended that anyone capable of critical thinking can patch problems that make their games less enjoyable. Hopefully, me bringing up a few of my gripes with the system can keep you all aware of issues that could show up in your games. Obviously, balance doesn't always equate to fun, but I think tabletop games should always have that illusion of fairness, even if it's never truly there. But hey. Okay, I want to bring up something and address it first. He just compared it to D and D and said, "Thank Pathfinder to D and D and say, thank goodness you're part of the D and D community." Um, hey, wh who are you, Blaine Simple? Um, I'm I'm gonna say something here. You've been great this entire video. I've agreed with a lot of what you said, man. Um, what you said just now is part of the problem of what's plaguing the pen and paper table cop gaming community. There is no D&D &D community in Pathfinder community. We are all part of the same hobby. We are all playing tabletop games. And D&D 5e is going to go away soon. And that's not because it's bad, but sooner or later Wizards is going to want to print a new edition. And there'll be 6th edition because just like Spaceballs 2 the quest for more money there'll be 6th edition the quest for more money they'll run out of supplement material and they'll want you to buy the base 3 books again and this is going to happen um, we've seen it happen 4 times already it'll happen again and at this point the question will be if you like it will you play it will you be a, D a you know, Wizards of the Coast D&D &D loyalist and play it or will you be forced to move on and now eat your words? Those of us who played in 3.5, or I started in 2nd edition. Yes, I remember Thacko. And we played in 3.0, we played in 3.5. We played Pathfinder when 3.5 started to get a little too bloated. I played 4th edition when it came out, but there wasn't a lot of people playing it, so I continued to play Pathfinder. Um, I tried Pathfinder 2nd, but again, there's not a lot of people playing it. Because there are D and D communities, and I think Pathfinder Second is a very viable game, and in some ways better than Fifth Edition. In some ways, not. I think the not having advantage disadvantage hurts it. I think that makes it a very streamlined game for Fifth Edition. And I think that seeing it as a D and D community versus a Pathfinder community hurts us all as a tabletop community. And I think it limits you being able to play these other games. There's a lot of fantastic games out there. I was just watching a podcast from the Savage Worlds devs last night talking about their new content. And if you've never played Savage Worlds, I highly recommend you check it out. It is a wonderful system with a lot of things to offer. Go back and try GURPS. Go back and try Bessem. They just came out with a new uh, system, I think, f fourth 
that looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, I saw your anime art style. I think you would like it. And if you like those kind of games, try it. Uh, there's a ton of games. Cortex is coming out with some great things right now. So, don't feel that you're strictly D&D. This hurts it. Want to know what is totally balanced and super cool? My own anime into D&D homebrew packs. Filled with a okay, so I think what he just has left is a ad. Alright, so he's just got an ad left. Um, so we're going to address the one other issue we're going to talk about right here. Is where he talks about patching. He's just going to talk about patching D&D to make it how you want it. Um, and this comes into rule zero. And you will probably hear me say this many more times as you listen to my content. Rule zero is the biggest bunch of crap you will ever read in D&D. It is a cop-out, and it should not be in rule in D&D at all. Because... D&D is meant for a very specific style of game. It is designed fundamentally to play a certain way, and the rules encourage that. If you are trying to force a different style of game into Dungeons & Dragons by patching a million things, you are doing Dungeons & Dragons a disservice, and you're doing yourselves a disservice. If what you want is a an eldritch horror-filled investigative game, just go play Call of Cthulhu. It is a better game for that. Don't think that you're a Dungeons & Dragons loyalist who has to play Dungeons & Dragons because you that's what you've always played and it's what all your friends play. If you want this type of game, go play a game that's better at it. If what you want to play is this pulpy action game where you're doing absurd, off-the-top things that, you know, a roll of the dice can give you the most insane results ever, and you're Indiana Jones falling out of a plane with a, landing on, you know, with a, what was it, an inflatable raft landing on the top of a mountain. Go play Savage Worlds. That system is made for these absurd critical role moments. And I don't mean critical role the TV show, or the podcast i mean all of the dice in it explode so you can get criticals that look i have three times my dice explode where if you roll the max on it, it's like look i rolled critical 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 yeah you just critical four times let's see what happens and if you want gritty down to the moment action where you can tweak every little thing about your character gurps is amazing if you want you know a rules light role play where you just kind of see what happens and then roll with it in a you know very freeform system. Fate or Cortex are both great systems for that. You don't need to play D and D to have fun role playing if you're barely playing D and D anymore. If you've patched D and D five E so it doesn't even look like five E then why are you playing it to begin with? You might even find that 2nd edition or 1st edition it more closely resembles what you want, and you can play that. Or you don't even need a rule system. They're just hang out with some friends on voice chat and roleplay. You don't need to be bound by D&D. And that's kind of a point I like to get across, is D&D is a game. It has a system, and the rules are there for a reason. And at the end of the day, you're playing a tabletop game that has some role-playing in it. And if you want to role-play, I love role-play. And if you want to play a game that's different than Dungeons & Dragons, play a different game. You know, I, I love to play different systems because they encourage different things. Um, I'm reading through Analyze right now, which is a fantastic diceless system. And it looks absolutely amazing. Oops, that was a Windows alert. My apologies. And 
these are things that you should definitely look into. But anyway, thank you for joining me as we had an actual reaction to D&D isn't a balanced game, which we do in fact agree with. D&D is not a balanced game. But this isn't what I expected from him talking about this. Um, i not really sure what the point of this video talking about it. Like, he didn't go in and explain where it was specifically unbalanced. Like, I, I could go in and if people want, I can talk about the idea of the tier list of the characters, which make it difficult to balance encounters. Uh, which is way better than older editions, by the way. You don't run the issue like you did in Pathfinder or 3.5, where if you have two divine spellcasters, like a cleric and a druid, or a cleric, even a cleric and a wizard, and then you have a fighter and a rogue, after like level five, you, you, your cleric and your fighter and your rogue might as well not be there. So you don't run into those problems anymore, which is wonderful. And you're also not terribly dealing with unbalanced magic items to the most extent. He mentioned a few, but they're all pretty much balanced uh, within the context of the rules. Bounded accuracy, which has done amazing to secure the classes into a more consistent leveling curve. There's no real points in the leveling curve, where one class is amazingly stronger than others, with a few exceptions, Moon Druid at level 2, uh, Clerics at level 1 tend to overshine the other classes, you know, Source, stuff like that. Uh, warlocks hit level 2 and hit their power spike a little earlier. Once you get out of those first few levels, all the classes even out a little bit more. You know, if we're not talking like a few of them. You know, he mentioned a, you know, couple of builds, but they're not that much stronger than just maxing your stats early. So, yeah. This has been my response um as I ramble and watch a video. Thank you everyone for coming and expect to see more content like this in the future. Have a good one. Bye.